Good afternoon. This presentation is about the pap smear. My name is Dr. Hoda Amir, and this is sponsored by the American Board Certified Doctors for Egypt, and they are not responsible for the content of this uh, lecture. And I'd also like to take this moment to thank Dr. Rulong Shen from Ohio State University for providing some of the uh, photo micrographs. So the first thing we're going to do is just have an overview of HPV, what it's about. So HPV is a double-stranded DNA virus. Uh, there are over 150 uh, genotypes. Uh, the IARC classifies them as group 1 uh, through group 3, depending on how carcinogenic they are. Um, and the lower risk ones, such as um, type 6 and 11, which are not carcinogenic at all, uh, cause genital warts or laryngeal papillomatosis, uh, while the other types obviously cause more, um, are more carcinogenic. Uh, type 16 and 18 are the most that are most present worldwide. Type 16 causes 50% of cervical cancers worldwide, while 18 and 16 together cause about 70%. Uh, HPV is also not just a women's thing, it's also a male thing. It's present in overall prevalence of 20% among men and uh, is involved in up to 50% of penile cancers. And with regards to men, HPV 16 is the most uh, common uh, frequent type. Uh, there are two main aspects of HPV <clears throat> that have made a significant um, print on its management and treatment worldwide. So the first thing is the invention of screening. If we talk about the screening, the timeline of screening has actually been, um, uh, let's see, mainly starting over here in the 80s when Harold Zurhausen discovered that HPV was linked to cervical cancer. Uh, over here, you have George Papanicolou beginning to work on um, vaginal smears and so on. Uh, and then you start over here in the 2000s, the uh, invention of um, the molecular testing. Um, and you have also the introduction of the, <clears throat> the vaccines um, in the late 2000s. So depending on where you are, uh, there are different screening guidelines. Uh, so for example, um, in areas like France, they begin right away with uh, genotyping. Uh, and depending on what that genotype result is, they incorporate um, the HP, the, um, the pap smears. Um, in the US, you have the different groups such as the ACS, the ASCP, uh, the task force for uh, provincial um, STDs was in 2018 revised. You have ACOG, ACP, and each one of these have a different uh, kind of approach, but generally they all uh, have, uh, you know, incorporation of, of the molecular plus the PAP testing in different time, um, in different timings. So let's talk a little about the HPV testing. Uh, sensitivity of cytology is on average 20% to 40% less lower than the HPV test. Um, so you have the, uh, let's see, now it's become, there's different types. There's chiogen, there's uh, hologic, there's the cobus. There's different kinds of approaches to uh, different kinds of ways of using it. It has become more and more mainstream. So now you can actually buy this at like your local, your local um, drugstore and have it sent in and sent out. Uh, for limited income technologies, you have uh, lower costs which are being assessed and uh, like the care. Um, and generally speaking, eventually more and more molecular testing will become more uh, mainstream um, and uh, maybe even replace pap smears on many levels. Uh, there's also something called the visual inspection with acetic acid, and I'm not really going to refer to that because I don't really, it's, it's, it's has a very low um, specificity, and so we don't really recommend it on any level. When we come to cytology, we're going to talk about the pap smear. There's two main methods. Uh, there used to be the conventional method, okay, and that one obviously has, uh, is still present in a lot of lower income settings. Uh, the two main companies are ThinPrep and, um, and SurePath. They both have a different um, equipment and so on. Uh, to, uh, and then there's something called the rehydration method. And this is a method that I really recommend for anyone 
who is usually using conventional preparations. And um, it's very simple. It's basically instead of, um, you know, instead of putting the, the slide directly into alcohol, you let it air dry and then you rehydrate it. And uh, it definitely helps remove the backgrounds and the uh, excess blood that's in the background and really helps the visibility. So um, let's see what else. Uh, let's go back into the history. So we have Oro Babis. He was the first one in 1927, excuse me, 1927, who uh, referred to, uh, who began the idea of collecting cervical cells. And actually in Romania, if you live there, they're gonna refer to it as Babis Papaniculo. Dr. George Papaniculo is obviously a little bit more, um, is better known. Here he is, and he, um, so he, excuse me, um, so he was the one who first in 1943 worked with his GYN or uh, friend and they managed to recognize all these. And I like to always give credit to Mr. Hashimi Murayama who actually drew these pictures. He was a Japanese American who was, um, who worked hard uh, drawing these uh, pictures. So uh, after all that, we can talk about, uh, based on the morphology of these cells, the Pathesta system, which was introduced in 1988 till today, divided them into different groups, uh, Milm, Ascus, Elso, Ask, Ace, H, so, and Malignant. And we can go over the Pathesta system um, in a little bit, but this is from the book. Uh, and they also put um, criteria for accept acceptable uh, pat smears, and you can look those up as well uh, in the book. So, going back, um, let's talk a moment about um, the management is based on both of those together, the cytology and the results of the ascosis. I'm talking about in the U.S., obviously. So these are all, you can get these all from ASCP online. Uh, but they show you what the, uh, just an example of each one of these, for example, like ASCUS, uh, what do you do if the woman has ASCUS? You would repeat the cytology in a year if it's negative routine, um, or if, uh, or you could do HPV testing, which is actually preferred. And if it's positive, then you continue ma manage the same way as LCIL. Negative, you can repeat the co-testing in three years, so on and so forth. So you can uh, refer to those um, to uh, be aware of the management. Um, now going back um, after screaming, let's talk a little about the vaccine realities. Now the introduction of the vaccine was actually quite um, quite the breakthrough, and um, and it was very it is it is fairly uh, effective. And there's different types. There's the bivalent, quadrivalent, and um, the Gardasil 9, which is the one which is mostly used now in the US, which covers HPV 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, HPV 58. The cost per dose is about 97 to 120. Um, and unfortunately, that kind of puts, puts the um, lower income countries into lower and middle income countries. So um, the Gavi Alliance was an alliance of WHO, World Bank, a couple of other countries, even the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they provided uh, vaccines to the lower income countries, which are the ones that are dark purple here. Um, unfortunately, they made the cutoff, uh, well, not unfortunately, but it is the cutoff, which was uh, $1,500 for per capita threshold, which, um, which, uh, what's the word, excludes a lot of the middle income countries, which also have a large uh, population of poor individuals who probably could not afford this. Um, so an example of that is like Egypt, which is my country of origin, which is a middle income country, but the majority of people live below poverty, but however, they didn't make the cut for the Gavi Alliance. So, um, so as you can see, there's a large different group between the countries that have been able to adequately fight um, HPV and those who have not. Uh, generally speaking, HPV is recommended at the ages of 11 or 12 years old, and um, it's also recommended for more higher risk groups for age 26 and over. So we already discussed management. Um, now let's... 
Let's go back now. All right, so we're done with that. Now let's go and get started on uh, our pap smears. Before you approach any pap smear, the first thing you've got to do is really review the um, the uh, clinical part. So let's look at the age of the patient, the last menstrual period, if it's a woman, uh, relevant history, whether or not the person has an IUD, has history. Uh, and then you scan the slide first to just look at the general cellularity, predominant patterns, and groups of cells versus single cells, and the background, of cell and then after that, move on to the cellular morphology. So there's different kinds of areas. The negative ones are the NILM and the reactive and the negative but with bugs like organisms and then you have the epithelial cellular abnormalities which are either squamous or glandular so these are called the happy pappy uh, to understand the um, the uh, the pap smear you have to also understand that these cells are all responding to um, hormones so you have lower estrogen cells the lower estrogen states will decrease the maturation of the squamous layer, while higher estrogen states will increase the turnover. So lower estrogen states are things like um, menopause or postpartum. Uh, so if you look at the different layers, you can try to remember how there was like a basal layer and then as they become more and more, um, uh, what's the word, as they become more and more mature, they become much more uh, squamoid. So, um, so over here would be a very low estrogen state, which is considered like the parabasal, uh, which is like things like, uh, sorry, menopause. And these are called parabasal cells. Parabasal cells, if you, as you can see, they have very rounded borders. They form like these kind of sheets. Um, and they are fairly uh, uniform, very fine chromatin, and they have about, they're about 50 microns in, um, um, in their size. As the cells, as they have more and more estrogen, things become more mature. And then you have the mixture of intermediate cells, uh, which start to be more evident. And then finally, if things become very mature, you find uh, the intermediate and superficial cells all together. So uh, the superficial cells are known for having a very small pycnotic nucle nuclei, these tiny, very uh, pinpoint. Uh, the nucleus is very small, it's about 10 microns. And you can find these keratohyaline granules. The intermediate cells have uh, a longitudinal groove occasionally. You can see it like at this one right here. And they have a little bit larger at 35 microns. Uh, now, as you move along, you'll get to the uh, squamo and endocervical junction right here. And so over here, this is what this would translate into being if you saw that on the pap smear, which is what they call picket scent. The important thing is that these ones are very uniform again. They're all facing this way. And if you put a cross section, cut them across, you'll end up with this thing which looks like a honeycomb or bee, um, you know, like a honey, honeycomb bee, whatever uh, you want to call that. Uh, they're about 50 microns, which makes them about the same size of the nuclei as the uh, parabasal microns um, cells. They're very uh, finely granular. And so that would be the endocervix. Now, if you keep going even higher, what are you gonna hit? You'll hit the lower uterine segment or the endometrium itself. Um, depending on when the cycle is, you can also find a lot of endometrium, endometrial cells. Endometrial cells are known for being very dark and they do a lot of this molding. Um, there's something called an exodus, which can show up at day six to eight. It's like a 3D ball. And if you look at it here, it looks like it has kind of rounded sort of borders all together. Um, you can kind of appreciate uh, the 3D uh, look for it, uh, 3D kind of look. Uh, the lower uterine segment is occasionally you will find the stroma, so it's like mixed with stroma. Um, uh, you'll find these palisading nuclei and then like these stroma, which are longer, sort of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, spindly kind of in different ways. So, um, so that's for the happy pappy. The happy pappy is very well organized. It's very, you can expect, uh, what's the word? It's very predictable. You can expect it based on uh, the person's age and, uh, and time. So now let's talk a little about reactive situations and so on. Once again, we're gonna talk about 
it's uh, the hormonal aspect. And so um, in the lower estrogen states and then the higher estrogen states. So the lower estrogen states, obviously you won't expect a lot of the keratosis. Um, instead, uh, so you'll see the parabasal cells that we mentioned before. Uh, for post atrophy and postmenopausal, uh, they're also characterized by having things, these things called these blue balls, which are sort of like debris, DNA debris. Uh, sometimes you can find inflammation. Here are the parabasal cells that we were talking about. And it corresponds to this very compact kind of uh, cell without a uh, layer without much uh, maturation. Uh, once again, this picture was from before where it shows you there's different levels of maturation, but not a lot of the uh, superficial kind of uh, cells that you would expect when there's uh, a good amount of maturation. The other thing is it looks kind of empty. So if you look at it from far away, it's empty, uh, lots of blue. Um, so that would be menopause or atrophy. Um, and like I said, if there's inflammation, you would cause it <clears throat> atrophic vaginitis. Let's talk a moment about pregnancy. So pregnancy has incomplete maturation. The majority are intermediate cells, and there's something called navicular cells. Navicular cells were uh, basically uh, a progester progesterone glycogen effect. Uh, they're kind of yellowish occasionally. They have like, um, and whoever saw it first, I suppose, uh, thought that they looked a lot like, um, like um, they looked a lot like boats. So they called it navicular cells. Here's a good example of this kind of glycogenated yellowish look to it. Uh, also, you can have uh, something called the areus stellar, which is basically um, these stimulated endometrial glands which form clusters. Um, the nuclei can be kind of irregular. And this isn't a very good uh, photomicrograph. This is from the Bethesda group. I don't, I don't think you see it a lot. So. Uh, just keep in mind that this is what it might look if you have a uh, pregnant individual, which is also why it's important to find that out. Now let's talk about hyperkeratosis and parakeratosis in the high estrogen states. And uh, anucleate squames, basically, is what they would look like. Lots of keratohyaline granules, lots of clusters of just kerat keratinized cells. Uh, sometimes they can be very orange and have an orangophilic kind of look to them. Um, so that's a, another reactive change for hyperkeratosis that you might see. Squamous metaplasia, if you're talking about, once again, this area of the squamo-columnar junction of the uh, cervix, sometimes these cells can undergo squamous metaplasia. So these are glands that have undergone squamous metaplasia. And if you look at them on a pap smear, they correspond to kind of having these, um, they have a kind of a parabasal like look to them. And uh, nucleus is about 50 microns. The NC ratio is still less than 50. And sometimes they have these spidery processes. So this is also from the Bethesda book. And um, excuse me, this is totally acting up today. Um, so over here, we can look at this one where you can see how it's starting to get more and more. Um, keratinized, I guess it's like, uh, and um, what else can we talk about here? All right, tubal metaplasia. So the, um, the lining of these glands can also undergo tubal metaplasia, which means they start to take the characteristics of the, uh, of the uh, fallopian tube, right? So it's ciliated and columnar. Uh, they can kind of look pretty scary sometimes. <clears throat> but uh, when they're all clustered together. But if you get a decent one by itself, it's kind of, I guess, cute. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let's go up here. And here's a good example of a cluster all together. And over here as well. Uh, see how can, they can kind of look really scary, but you can appreciate the cilia on different levels and look at the friends they keep, so the areas around it. All right, the next group is repair. So repair is also referred to, always referred to as a school of fish. These, um, uh, they look a lot like metaplastic cells. Um, this is what a school of fish looks like. Uh, this is what it looks like all together sometimes. And if you think of the little nucleoli as being eyes, that's just reactive repair. 
Radiation ATP is something that you will see often. Um, multinucleation, giant cells, polychromasia. Uh, as you can see, these massive cells, they look, they have different kind of colors. This is for the Bethesda book, I believe, as well. This one is from our, um, our pictures. Uh, also, you can find inflammation, neutrophils, lots and lots of neutrophils that can be, you know, an inflammatory response. Uh, IUD changes. IUDs are also can show lots of vacuolation along with reactive changes, and that's important to know too while you're looking at it so you don't over call, you know, like an adenocarcinoma or something. This is just a reactive change due to um, the presence of an IUD. Here's another example right there. Okay, let's see what else there is here. Uh, lymphocytes and follicular cervicitis. So, yes. Lymphocytes and follicular cervicitis. That's from the uh, Bethesda book. This is from ours. So lots of clusters of lymphocytes, which are really small in comparison to the rest of the um, cell. So those are a general overview of uh, the different kinds of reactive changes uh, that you can see, even though they're still happy pappies. Now let's go and talk about the unhappy pappy, which is the um, the unhappy but happy, the organism. So you can have multiple different kinds of organisms that you can see on uh, pap smears. Let's start with herpes. Uh, herpes uh, is the classic three M's, which are multinucleation, molding, and margination of the chromatin. These are some examples. Uh, those dense eosinophilic inclusions, these ones right here. Um, let's see, maybe these ones here. Uh, they're intranuclear inclusions, and these are called cowdery. CMV is another example of one which has an inclusion, which is also an inclusion, but it's a very large intraeosinophilic, commonly seen in the immunocompromise. Um, these are considered, in a pregnant woman, these are considered uh, emergency situations. You really have to inform them because uh, that would change the management with regards to delivery. Uh, next in line is candida. So candida, they referred to it as uh, the pseudohyphae kind of just connect to each other and they're referred to, referred to as either kebabs or spaghetti with meatballs depending on which one you don't like the most. So um, there's also candida glabrata which doesn't really have pseudohyphae but if you look really closely let's look at this one you can see how there's the the hyphae and then the cells kind of just get stuck all over it you know what I'm saying yeah um, here's another example you can see the hyphae so that's the, uh, with regards to the um, candida. Next in line, uh, vaginal flora. Shift in vaginal flora is uh, compatible with bacterial vaginosis, which what happens is that if there's a shift in the uh, pH, uh, instead of the lactobacillus rod-shaped bacilli, uh, you have a whole bunch of other ones, uh, Gardenella or Bacteroides. And these ones cause uh, clue cells, if they don't have any inflammation, you can call it vaginosis. But if there's, you know, inflammation, you call it an itis. And they think it kind of looks like a shag rug, if you know what a shag rug looks like. And you just have to look pretty closely. You'll see how they're all just covered up with these tiny little dots, which are very much like, um, uh, I guess they look kind of shaggy. Next in line, trichomonas. Trichomonas is a pear-shaped organism. Uh, and these ones are very pale. Uh, they have a flagella. They're often associated with something called leptothrix. Uh, so here's what it looks like. This is from the Bethesda book as well. Flagella, nucleus, undulating membranes. Um, they also, uh, sometimes there's single little cells over here just floating along. Other times they jump on board and they call it a picnic or a tricnic where they're all eating up. And here's leptothrix, which, like I said, is commonly associated with, um, with trichomonas. Next in line, actinomyces. Actinomyces apparently looks like a ball of wool or some cotton candy. Um, so uh, these are generally acute angle branching and they, uh, it's very commonly associated with an IUD. Lactobacillus can kind of look the same, 
but they're not quite as woolly and the, the, uh, the strands are a bit more uh, thicker and longer. So here's an example of very woolly, fuzzy blob of actinomyces. Next in line is chlamydia trachomata. So chlamydia used to be diagnosed by the uh, pap smear. It really isn't anymore just because it can overlap with so many other things, uh, reactive, um, reactive um, vacuoles. So it used to be, but you know, you can kind of suspect, suspect it. Uh, so generally now it's done using a nucleic acid application test. Uh, it has an 8.5 cents percent sensitivity, but it would, would look like this. It would have a targetoid inclusion. Um, and uh, you could have hyperchromasia, acute inflammation. But this is like, for example, a reactive change that might confuse somebody uh, if it was. Here's another area of more vacuolated changes, but it has those little dots, which makes you think, well, are those nebular bodies? What are those? So. I don't know. Um, uh, generally speaking, like I said, we don't use usually use it to diagnose um, any of those. So let's just make sure we covered all of those. Uh, Tinomyces, yes, we did. Okay, good. So let's go on to the squamous epithelial lesion. So squamous epithelial lesions, you take it from one side all the way to the next. So ASCUS is atypical squamous cells, right? Um, sometimes it helps to kind of think of it according to size. Ascus is the largest size. It's going to be 2.5 to 3 times the size of the intermediate cells, or 2 times the metaplastic cells, uh, and it has minimal nuclear changes. Sometimes it's orangophilic, in which case it's called atypical PK. Uh, and then moving along, you might see, uh, if you talk about like repair, you have parabasal cells and atrophy, the repair changes, squamous metaplasia at about 50 microns in comparison to um, uh, the, uh, the more um, abnormal changes, NC ratio is less than 50%. And then you go up to ASK H or H cell. So these are, these, these, these nuclei will be 1.5 to two times in comparison to the intermediate cells. The NC ratio is increasing and that one has, you know, irregularity and hyperchromasia. And then you go all the way to H cell where you have a whole bunch of those crowded groups and uh, still the same size, but the general, uh, but it's just much more irregular. l cell is the largest. It's three times the nuclei, three times the size of an intermediate cell. So it's larger than ASCUS, actually. And uh, those are involving actually mature cells. Um, and you want to compare them to the intermediate cells and the uh, repair. So let's go ahead and start with ASCUS. So ASCUS, every day is an ASCUS day, and that is because um, over 90% of, uh, of ASC interpretations are ASCUS. So they're suggestive of, of uh, squamous interpretial lesion, but the quantity or the quality is just not um, sufficient. Uh, 40 to 50% of women with ASCUS will be infected, uh, actually be, are infected by high-risk HPV. So um, you look for minimal changes, squamous differentiation, like we said, nuclei is 2.5 times the intermediate cell. So you're talking about 35 microns times 2.5 or two times the metaplastic cell. And there's an incomplete kind of uh, HPV effect with coilocytosis or partial halos. And sometimes you can have an atypical parakeratosis, like we said, which is very orangophilic. Uh, you want to differentiate it from air atypical repair, which shows irregular chromatin uh, as well, and um, increased NC ratio, or postmenopausal tapia, which is atrophic cells and parabasal cells with an occasionally enlarged nucleus. So this is from the uh, the Bethesda book. I like this book, this picture, just because it shows you what I mean by the 35 micros, uh, microns intermediate cell, and how that compares to the ELSA, which is three times, and the ASCUS, which is two and a half to three times. Um, so let's look at some of these ELSO pictures here. I mean, excuse me, these ASCUS pictures. So you can see how the, um, the nucleus is enlarged, but it doesn't have the features of coilocytic changes. So it's not quite there. Also, what if you have, you know, these wrinkled membranes, that's from the Bethesda book as well. What if you have, here, here they're starting to look a little bit more orangophilic. 
once again, they don't have the complete spectrum of the um, of the coilocytic changes. Here it's starting to change. You can kind of see the grooves, but not quite enough, especially the quantity. Like if you only have a few cells like this, well, how far are you going to go with it? You know what I mean? So um, let's see what else there is. Here's a reactive halo. All right. So uh, let's talk about, hmm, looks like I, um, what's the word? I jumped there for a moment. Next, move on to ELSO. So ELSO, um, if you remember how it looks in H and E's, you have these, uh, these um, the coilocytic changes, right? So what you're seeing is basically this H and E, right? So uh, you're seeing it on the side as just the cells. Ki67, if you remember, want to remember for um, for L, so it corresponds to about Sin1. This is the largest cell. It has a large nuclear size, about three times the normal intermediate cell. It has coilocytosis, which is a perinuclear um, clear area. It has a very defined perinuclear and peripheral rim, and um, so you can see how well defined that rim is. And uh, let's see. And the chromatin is uniformly distributed. It can be coarse to densely opaque. Uh, can also show um, keratinization or orangophilia like these ones. See how large these cells are. See the, the grooves. Um, these are orangophilic, so you can't really see the halo as easily. But um, Yeah, so here's another example. It's kind of easy to see from lower power because you can appreciate the binucleation here, the irregular, they call it some kind of resonoid where it's wrinkled membranes. And like I said, there's this peripheral rim of the chromatin just kind of, um, uh, what's the word, um, getting all uh, bunched up on the edges. So this is another good example. Also is fairly easy to recognize, I would say. Um, here's another example, binucleation, halos. Uh, these are some pictures. This looks like a piggy. This is courtesy of Dr. Shed, of course. <laughs> this is for Halloween, in case any of you get scared easily. Here's a snake or yeah, an eel. So you can have all kinds of shapes and sizes when it comes to ELSO. Now let's talk about ASCH. We're starting to go into the higher grade uh, areas. So ASCH, the main thing is that the uh, nuclei are smaller than ELSO, but the, uh, the NC ratio is higher. So these are cases that are suggestive of HSO, but they're just not enough. There's not an, either they're not enough number or the quality is just not quite there. Nuclei are 1.5 to 2. Um, sometimes they look like atypical immature metaplasia patterns, so they have small cells, high NC ratio. Um, the uh, the um, nuclear outline is also wrinkled. Other times they have this crowded sheet pattern, which makes them difficult to, to uh, distinguish from reactive cells or atrophies. Um, and there's also the atrophic pattern, which can also be confusing. Mimics of ASCH, isolated under cervical cells, degenerated endometrial cells, macrophages occasionally, uh, intrauterine devices, pregnant, postpartum, atypical decidualized cells. So it does have a lot of different kinds of, uh, basically they are H cell, but they're just not enough. So these ones look large-ish not as large as um, the coilocytes. There's no none of the halo. These ones are very wrinkled. These are starting to have a more orangophilic kind of look to them. The NC ratio is definitely higher, right? Uh, you can appreciate the increased NC ratio and how abnormal they look. Always compare them to the surrounding cells. So what if you only had these two? Um, what are you gonna do with those? So the idea is that you think they might be HCL, and they might be, but they're just not enough. When you get to HCL, 
you're talking about this kind of look to it, right? So you have the P16 is uh, very highly reactive. Ki67 is involving the whole thing. And the maturation is much, uh, is, is disappearing while you have all these larger cells. So these ones um, can be either single cells or syncytial aggregates. Once again, if you only have these three, you probably would just call it ask H. But if you saw them all over the place, that's when you'd start to get worried. Here's a nice example of a whole group altogether. And that's helpful when they're all in a group, I suppose. Another example, all in a group, very large. The chromatin is getting very more, is a lot more coarse than what you would expect. Uh, now let's talk about if they are keratinizing, so you can see them. Um, they have that very orangophilic kind of uh, look to them, but you can still appreciate the very high NC ratio. And then the hyperchromatic crowded groups. And these ones, um, you can see the membranes, they appear kind of, so when you look at it on lower power, you can kind of pick them up uh, by these hyperchromatic groups. And if you go higher power, they don't have the 3D kind of look of um, endometrial. You can see how there's larger cells. You can see how coarse they are, irregular membranes. Always compare them to a very nice intermediate cell or a superficial cell. So those are H cell. Now let's talk about squamous carcinoma. Cancer is the answer to quote one of my favorite people, Dr. Peter Kobalka. And uh, so in the squamous cell car carcinoma or keratinizing, uh, there are single cells. A lot of them look like tadpoles. If you don't know what a tadpole is, it's like a baby frog. They look like that. Um, that's for the keratinizing ones. Uh, you all remember what keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma looks like, I suppose, and on H and E. Well, then you have the non-keratinizing, and these ones are going to look a lot like just H cell, uh, but you'll see a lot more of the tumor diathesis in the background and so on that will make you aware that this is definitely most likely a, um, a tumor. So this is an area of, of a cluster of malignant cells, and you can see this tumor diathesis in the background. Uh, the tadpoles, here are some tadpoles right here. There's one, there's one. You can see uh, what else. Here's an, this is a markedly irregular nucleus, right? You can appreciate that. So, um, and of course, this one. So H, so the um, the uh, squamous cell carcinoma is fairly easy to recognize when it's uh, keratinizing. If it's not keratinizing, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's still it would look like H cell, but just more than what you would expect. Radiation, always watch out for that polychromasia, that kind of look to it and the irregularities uh, that you might find. And the other mimics of uh, hyperchromatic crowded groups. So uh, that goes to the, that's it for the squamous cells. And let's move on to glandular lesions. So glandular lesions can be, you just have, first you have to remember the different kinds of cells. So let's just remind ourselves we have endometrial cells and we have endocervical cells. See how the endocervicals have that picket, cell, picket fence and the endometrial cells look like polyballs. They call them like little balls of, um, of uh, you know, little balls of something. Okay, so uh, we're talking about atypical endocervical cells, endometrial cells, glandular cells, endocervical or adenocarcinoma in situ, and then you have adenocarcinoma, which is either endocervical, endometrial, um, extrauterine, non or NOS, or other malignant neoplasms. So let's go ahead and talk about the, where should we start? Let's start with endometrial adenocarcinoma. So that's going to look a lot like um, those polyballs, basically, polypellets just got into groups and they're just bigger, irregular, and they look a lot like adenocarcinoma where you would see um, in a lot of different places. The one thing that's characterizing about them is that they have these vacuoles um, and they also have 
intracytoplasmic neutrophils, which are known as a bag of poly poly pellets. Uh, either way, um, here's an example. You can tell these are malignant cells, right? But you can also appreciate this kind of vacuolated appearance to them. Let's see this one. Same thing, look at this massive cell over here. Um, and it looks like endometrial because it's more rounded borders and it almost, almost looks like uh, if you think of the way endometrial cells look and then just you turn them all into malignant cells, then that kind of helps uh, imagining what I'm talking about. When it comes to the neutrophils, these polyballs right here, see how they're associated with the cells? Um, and that's an interesting phenomena, but something that you can also keep in mind to look at. Ooh, this is a good example right here. Um, this one. Yep, so here's a large cell. Here's some of these um, evacuated stuff. Oops, don't go away. All right, and then you will also appreciate the background, necrosis. Yep, this definitely looks like it's, um, it's an endometrial adenocarcinoma. What about endocervical adenocarcinoma? It's still an adeno, but um, there's a lot of overlap with AIS. <coughs> These ones are characteristic of having a macronucleoli, and generally that <coughs> is what will be your tip off, um, your main tip off. Once again, try to imagine the picket, cell, the picket fence and turn all those cells into uh, malignant cells. But that prominent nucleolus is almost always a tip off. And once again, look at the very busy background. So, um, vacuolation again is common. They will have the necrotic tumor clinging diathesis. Next in line is endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ. So, the in situ change, they believe, they always refer to it as looking like feathering. So, like these cytoplasmic kind of tags from the periphery. Um, the nuclei are still enlarged and everything, but they have this feathering kind of look to it, which means they're just still inside there. And if you want to remember how that kind of looks, uh, you can appreciate the P16 um, so that you can kind of remember what we're looking at. So look at this gland. It's like normal and then it becomes in situ change. Um, so uh, let's see what else. The very large cells, you can appreciate the malignancy. It's mainly the pattern in which they're taking, which makes you think of a feather. So look at this feathering. Okay, so think of a peacock. I don't know, a blue feathered bird. Mimickers, our favorite. We always like um, the tubal metaplasia. And this one looks like radiation with the polychromasia. So keep in mind, keep your eyes open. Uh, which I hope you would be doing since you're looking at a microscope. And remember, don't drink and drive. Okay, atypical endometrial cells. Here we are, endocervical endometrial. Here is a heart. It's the shape of a heart, but it's still atypical. Once again, this is the categories where there's something going on, but you can't write, call it outright um, a malignant change. Uh, mildly enlarged nucleoli, vacuolated cytoplasm. You've excluded all the other issues, right? The nucleoli is not that big. And you're gonna start worrying about neoplastic if you start seeing feathering, rosettes, mitosis, obviously. Um, nuclear enlargement can be uh, atypical glandular cells, endocervical. You can kind of say, yes, these are definitely endocervical. If you can kind of appreciate their honeycombing and they're a bit larger than usual. And uh, these would be the atypical glandular cells. This one's also forming a heart for some reason. So uh, these are all of the different uh, categories. Um, and uh, that's the end of uh, this lecture. And, uh, and good luck with everything. Thank you for listening.